You're listening to We Deep in Media. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Deep In with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder and CEO of We Deep In, Feminine Weapon, and also a certified professional relationship coach and matchmaker. If you haven't lately, go to wedeepen.com and check out all the upcoming social and transformational experiences that I have curated there for you. We have lots coming up in the fall of 2023. You'll see Unleash has been added in November. It's going to be in Sacramento. The theme is Wonder. 200 people at an intimate transformational Retreat festivals. It's one of my favorites. Yadi Iksa has been on this podcast multiple times, who is the host of that. So definitely check it out. Come out and join us for Unleash. There's also Wonderland Conference is happening in Miami. Wonderland Conference is by Microdose. It's a psychedelic conference with, I think there's, there might be like 4,000 plus people. They might even say 10,000. I, I, let's go with 4,000. Um, I'm going to be there facilitating. Uh, uh, an activation and a panel discussion on love. Bhakti Love Fest is this fall as well. That one is in October in California. Uh, really like a s- deeply spiritual festival with curtains and talks and magical human beings. Also coming up, you know, if, if this trend of adult play parties um, I've been noticing it and having discussions here on the podcast. The last episode was with Kinky Rabbit founders. And if you happen to be around Austin, Texas, or I believe this event is worth traveling for, we are hosting a unbound experience or boundless, a boundless experience here in Austin, Texas on August 12th of 2023. And it is um, Shibari, Shibari performance meets sound healing meets uh, intimacy education. I'm going to be facilitating a mind blowing panel with Dave Asprey, the father of biohacking and Kimmy Inch, who's a kink educator. And the experience will roll into a play party. Uh, you can check that out at wedeepen.com, get more details there. Also, we've curated uh, some of the greatest relationship courses, relationship renegades, deeper dating, as well as Amanda Young has a program. And I highly recommend these courses. I only curate the ones that the teachers that are, are supporting me in my own growth and relational journey. So check those out at wedeepen.com. If you do enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, follow, rate it, give it five stars. It helps more people find it, helps me continue to host it. And it also brings more people into the live experiences because why I love recording this podcast, what I enjoy most is being with you in real life. And whether that is at an event or even sometimes working with you privately one-on-one to support you in your own intimacy journey. I thoroughly love um, working one-on-one in a coaching capacity or uh, uh, matchmaking, you know, making introductions for you. And I see it as, you know, we go on an intimate journey together. (laughs) We're in our own practice of relating because doing that work with you is, um, it's intimate, it's tender. Our hearts are are super tender and we're going to get into the tenderness of the journey today and this desire to know, like, you know, our human brains, we want to know everything, what's going to happen when, how we're going to achieve it, when we're going to get there. Um, And there's, you know, love, love this life. It's a, it's a, it's a journey. It's, it's the life journey. I, for me, life equals love. We'll see what God fits in because we're going to talk of God is going to be part of this conversation today, which I haven't talked about him much. And I invited one of my dear best friends, sister from another country. (laughs) 
can say, um, into this podcast. This is her second time recording with me. And ever since I launched this new podcast, Deepen with Christina, from the beginning, I was like, send you when a recording, send you when a recording. And a year and a half later, it's finally happening. Sanyu is on episode 15 of Your Love Accomplice, removing the monkey monk. Monkey monk? Monkey monk. Monk. Monkey monk. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is a dear friend. She's a a bone healer from Uganda, Uh, has a, you know, one of the first graduates of Columbia University's program of narrative medicine. And I remember still probably around a decade ago, her and I met in New York City while we were drawing a naked man at a girl gathering at a fancy schwinky bar in New York City. And Sunny was new and she had said to me, you know, I want to be friends with people, but not those flaky people who you try to make plans with and then they don't respond. And I looked at her and I was like, okay, I'm going to be friends with you and we're going to do stuff together. And that's what we started doing. And because as you guys know, you know, my, I should have been hooked on phonics as a child. It's, it's pronouncing Sunyu's name actually took me a few times hanging out with her. And I'd be like, when is she going to say her name? Like it's S S A N Y U. I've never met another Sunyu. I don't, have you ever met another Sunyu? I did actually this, 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 past month or June, um, while I was home in Uganda, I met a little girl named Sunyu and she lives in Washington, DC. Yes. Oh, wow. I love that. I, I love Sunyu. So yes, it, it took me a moment to like my, for my brain to register this new name and this new human being. And I'm so grateful for this friendship and now journeying with you for the past decade. You're one of my teachers, uh, and mentors and sisters. And I think that, yeah, we, yeah, and, and someone who, too, it's like there's a real banter to it. You know, we can be spiritual and also f- fuck it all up at times. And yes. I say fuck it all up because I mean, like, <laughs> like we can have potty mouths as yes. well. Yes, we can have potty mouths. I think that's really important to distinguish between um, being vulgar. Um, it's the potty mouth that sometimes come out and uh, gives us a little more oomph into what we were trying to say. Um But yes, it is so good to be here with you, Christina. Um, I can't believe it was so long ago that we did our first recording together. Um, I remember where we recorded. We were in a closet (laughs) in your apartment in California. And it just really um, signifies um, our journeys, you know, where we've come and um, where we've come from, excuse me. And it's really wonderful to see how you've expanded, how you've stayed really focused and intentional um, with this work with We Deepen, um, with Feminine Weapon, um, just having that as a as a, a starting point um, and then watching it just grow into all these different ways in which you make connections with people. And I was very much uh, coming off my experience of living in Los Angeles and that comment of I'm just tired of flaky people. I so appreciate I love when you tell the story and I so appreciate that you took that on as the I'm going to be friends with this person. And, you know, I'm very blunt. Um, And I I could have uh, pushed you away in that in that statement. Um, But I know that we were divinely connected for a reason. So thank you. Thank you Mm -hmm. for taking on that challenge. You know what it was? It's the authenticity of that moment of what you said. It's like you said, what really was. I I think that's what drew me in. the, the, the realness to it. And it was, it was almost, I felt at the moment, it was like an invitation for real friendship and somebody also saying what they desired. And I, you were interesting to me. So I'm like, I can meet. Yes. Okay. I'm signing up. <laughs> Let's yeah. go. Yes. Yes. And that that recording that we did, your love accomplice of episode fifteen, and anybody who's listening, you can scroll back into the news feed, or the feed, not news feed, um, the feed of the this um, uh, show, and find episode fifteen because your love accomplice is tucked down in there. I recorded that from twenty seventeen to twenty eighteen, and you had just 
for the first time had given me a Reiki session. You're a master Reiki healer and had just removed my monkey monk like um, from me. And I was um, feeling, yeah, more clear and in that moment and more connected to my body, which is a conversation I want to go into today. Before we pushed record, we, you know, were catching up a moment and, you know, I was, I was sharing and both of us were sharing of, of that, um, you know, that, that struggle, I don't know if struggle is the right word, but of wanting to be and trust life, God, the universe, while at the same time being human and having desires and goals and things that we want to achieve and how those two, um, you know, they can, they can feel disconnected at times and the mind, the monkey mind can create all types of thoughts that, you know, and, and, and the thing is, you know, we learn we're not our thoughts. So whatever you're thinking, it's not even re- like you're making it all up in your mind. And then your emotions um, are part of the process. Your emotions, you know, want to guide you at times too. And they're not the best. The, your brain and your emotions are not the best guided system. And we landed on the body. And that's even too, if I stopped yesterday, I had all these things to do. And I ended up watching a, you know, a, a, a 50 minute movie on Gaia. Um, somebody, I believe is what's the word is I'll, 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 I can put that in the show notes, but it's this beautiful movie and, and it's on kind of the journey to enlightenment. It's so funny of when, when somebody says like, I want to be enlightened, <laughs> what is even that, uh, but of following the, the body always knows and the body is not the, the, you know, they're connected to the brain and it's connected to the heart and it's connected to the emotions. It's connected to the gut. Um, yeah, but instinctively letting the body lead the way. Yes. Yes. And to, to, to jump off from that statement, let the body lead the way. I was heavily interested in how to clear my own body of discomfort because that discomfort was starting to lead me into directions um, that weren't feeling good. Um, Now, discomfort can also be a great teacher. So as I started to learn more and more about my initial connection to my thoughts, my emotions and my body, I was steeped in my uh, master's in science program at Columbia in narrative medicine. And I also was moving away from the title Reiki master. I had really started to tap into my indigenous bone healing shamanic energy of my lineage. And so that discomfort that I was feeling was because I wasn't able to feel in my body, my true identity. I wasn't allowing myself to feel into whom I was becoming. Um, And a lot of that had to do with my journey around grief and losing people and death and dying. And I focused on death and dying and palliative care in grad school. Um, I became a death doula. Um, I was doing research on what it is to become and to be a caregiver and how can we support the caregivers? Because at the end of the day, the person that the caregiver is uh, supporting is going to die. What happens after? You know, are we paying attention to supporting those who are caring for those who are ill? And I spent a lot of time in that space of death, dying trauma um, to really understand my own um, in a different way. Um, From a Western standpoint, I have been in and out of therapy um, since I was a child Um, and because of what we are taught in this Western society is 
if you have trauma, you have to get rid of it. And the best way and the only way is to go to a therapist. That never sat with me, especially as a Ugandan American woman who understood from a very young age, the value of metaphysics and understanding how the body is what we need to focus in on. I was taught that as a child. So here we are getting older and all of these wonderful pieces of knowledge and wisdom that I was being taught as a child, I was forgetting, I was not tapping into. And so I decided to move away from focusing on death and dying to living, to wanting to bring in the stories that may have been traumatic in our life to rewrite them and see them as beautiful keys to understanding where we are today in the present and the desires that we have to move forward in in the future, right? In our future selves. Um, but was very, very potent to me, especially as I was in grad school, was the art of listening, the art of attentive listening, of radically listening to ourselves so we can understand the other person. And the, the, the practice of narrative medicine is to learn how we can allow our stories to be what guides us uh, particularly in the in the healthcare system, guide the physician to becoming better acute, more empathetic, and more of a listener to the patient, because those patient stories are are integral to how a doctor is doctoring. And often, actually not even often, doctors are not taught this in med school, period. So I'm at the medical school at Columbia University as a lecturer in spirituality and health. And it's a great class because it's an interprofessional class where not only do I have soon to be doctors, nurses, dentists, OT, um, PT, I have public health, um, you know, uh, professionals, I have chaplains, um, I have um who else? I mean, it's just, it's just a, almost like a mishmash of, of individuals who are in the health space, learning to connect the dots with themselves of how they see doctoring to understand that their own stories of where they are today are just as important to pay attention, pay attention to as are the stories of their soon to be patients or the patients that they are working with now. And that has opened up an even larger space for me to bring in my indigenous healing modalities and the knowledge and wisdom that I tap in and, and, and am cultivating more and more every day through my own daily practices that keep me present. What comes to be is that we always have to, or not always, we don't have to do anything, right? We got choices. What we should be doing is paying most attention to how we feel in the body. And as a bone healer, which is an indigenous teacher and, and medicine person that uh, literally helps heal bones, put bones back together, and also be able to pull out those stories that live in our bones, in our body, in, in the fascia, and understanding how that has played a role in who we are today. And being able to, as I said before, rewrite them, not forget them, acknowledge them, and even maybe say thank you to them. And, and begin to cultivate where we want to be physically, spiritually, emotionally, bodily. And that has been my true joy um, is to be a witness of not just of myself, but to be a witness and observe others in this transformational aspect of themselves. Um, and we always come back to what it means to listen, what it feels like to to listen to God, you know, before we got here, we had that conversation around God. And I said, thank you for, you know, bringing that word in. And my clients and mentees know when I do my one-on-one -on -one work through my pause three method, 
I use the word God. Um, and some people are very apprehensive of touching that word because of religion. God is not a religion. God lives in us and around us. And my first website was called Let Go and Let Love. However, the affirmation that I grew up with is Let Go and Let God. And I was too afraid to actually have that as my website mm -hmm. when I started, you know, 17 years ago or so. So, it's the coming back home to ourselves is the God in us. And when I say coming back to ourselves, it's feeling it's, it's, it's no, it's not necessarily feeling it's paying attention and observing and witnessing the sensations in the body to then become aware of how we can become more present at at that very moment, those sensations of joy or grief or sadness or apprehension or confusion come up and arise, we can just acknowledge that because we feel the sensation. So feel it. And this Western world was so quick to just, just keep going. We just go, you know, I just returned from Uganda a few days ago and I remember having a, um, a what, what do I call it? Um, my father, my, who I call Tata, um, noticed I was walking through, uh, we have a family resort and that's, I'm so grateful I was able to stay there. And it's right on the water of Lake Victoria. But before you get to the water, you're basically walking through a beautiful forest and the trees. And we have just, I mean, the birds that come through there is just magnificent. And my father, my tata noticed I was walking really quickly as if I was walking, you know, the streets of New York City. And he said, stop. I need to teach you how to walk. And I started laughing. I was like, tata, OK, I'm in my 40s here. OK, like my <laughs> I'm, I'm older. What are you talking about? I need to learn how to walk. But that moment of just learning how to be present in the moment to take in my surroundings and not look down, but look up and to slow down. I was listening and, and listening to the sensations of what it feels like making meaning out of that slowing down, out of that slowing of my steps and my posture became different. Um, I, I felt different just in those few moments of, of being pointed out as someone who is moving too quickly. And that's the energy I hope to continuously bring into my practice and sharing with others is the, the act of slowing down, the act of observing and witnessing the sensations in the body to understand who we are. Wow. Thank you for all that. You bring up some really interesting points to dive into, you know, number one, the importance you talk about story and, you know, I imagine the program, um, narrative medicine, we can conceptualize, like think of what that means. And we are, our brains, human beings, we're story making machines. Um, sometimes we're just even creating stories, you know, in between of specifically, you know, a lot of my, um, interest in this whole podcast is on the relational realm and in between, you know, time seeing somebody, you know, you're, you're in an experience of somebody and then when that separation happens, we make up all these types of stories that are happening in the in between. And, um, and a lot of people, you know, after innocently falling into love in our, you know, usually in our early years in childhood, then, uh, uh, you know, we collect heartbreak and that heartbreak can even happen with inside of the same relationship. It doesn't have to be that the heartbreak is from new relationships that are formed. And there's stories that in the mind continues to create. And I read a lot of what's happening in these specific Facebook groups around infidelity and, um, you know, th there's, there's healing after infidelity, um, infidelity support group, 
of all of these stories and I can, and, and they're all being intellectualized even within the space on Facebook of people typing back and forth to one another for their brains to process mm. new information. But I love how you're saying that in the practice of um, considering the story from a, a you know, because this is all health, like even to of a lot of disease can come from that um, emotional experience that you're having in life through heartbreak, um, through feeling disconnected to others, through the turbulence that happens um, or the trauma that's picked up in the body. That's what, you know, we could talk about like, yeah. And and there's environmental for sure. There's environmental um, circumstances that create disease as well. Um, and so the mind is then taking that and creating meaning out of it. And, but those, those are limit that we're limited by that. If we only believe what our brain says, because we're not our thoughts Mm -hmm. Um, and they can expand and shift and change. And you can even see that through conversations that you have with other people. When you connect with other human beings, you're like, wow, how do you think about that? And sometimes our society, we get so offended about how other people think about things. You know, Brene Brown has that relationship hack, uh, the story that I'm making up is, um, Mm. which is where, you know, if you're, if you're, the brain is starting to make up the stories of what it thinks and you take it to that person and you share, you know, from that sense of the story that I'm making up is, you know, when you didn't do this and that, I believe this and that. Um, And Another one that I like to use is, do you want to know how my brain thinks about that? Mm -hmm. And, and those are, those are, and I can, I can say from, you know, if we go back to you and I meeting, that was what I was drawn to in the beginning. It was that this realness of who you moment by moment of what you were thinking. And I think that's our, our, our connection point is there's the real deep authenticity inside of that and, um, and not, you know, blaming anybody else for any of the experiences um, that we're having or navigating and to realize that we're all living in some type of disillusion. (laughs) Again, you're not your thoughts. Um, And so, so then when you, you start to more of listen to the body and start to trust more of the body and, and um, you know, bringing God into the conversation, I, as well went through the experience of being triggered by God. I was raised Catholic and we went to church and church was where God was. And I would sit in the, you know, the, the, you know, the, what do you call those pews Mm -hmm. at the church? And these old guys would be talking about things that I'm like, you know, as a seven-year-old child, I'm like, what are you saying? And I go to CCD on Sundays and I'm mm. like, when is this over? <laughs> this is so boring. <laughs> uh, and then as I, you know, started to see, cause it took, it takes a little bit for the brain to kind of disconnect the God experience from religion. And I remember being in Los Angeles and walking around Lake Shrine um, mm-hmm. um, Lake Shrine is, a uh, Yogiyanda mm-hmm. is, a uh, temple. If I said his name accurately, yes. I, I do believe. Yes. Okay. And yeah, they have the beautiful temple there and the palisades and the meditation garden. You and I have been together yes, as well. Your birthday. Uh-huh. And I remember walking around there. One of the first times I arrived in LA and they had, you know, um, there's all these printed signs that speak about God. And I remember being triggered by them. I think I cut them out of pictures that I took Interesting. Um, because I didn't feel like God seemed limiting um, the religion and there was a confusion around it. But then as I began to more like it doesn't need to even be this term God. It's like there's you even the, they've done some some research of they've asked people who identify as being um, atheists if they believe in a higher power or something bigger than themselves, and a lot of times they'll say yes. Yeah. So it doesn't the universe, God, the creator, whatever it may be, um, and. You know, you mentioned that God is inside of us. 
and a part of us and guiding us as well. I don't think we are God. Um, I think we're in an experience with God, but I don't, we, we, we deep and we hosted during the pandemic um, online. We were doing a lot of, um, you know, debate, like thoughtful dialogue or discourse, you know, thoughtful discourse. I love how John Kirkpatrick from Epic Records, he had taught me this term, thoughtful dis discourse. And we did one on, is it okay to say I'm God? And while it was a, you know, more of somebody from the conscious community and another person who was the two people are dialogue conscious community and another one who was a preacher. And he said that part of the human suffering is believing that you are God. Mm. God is inside of you and God is guiding you, but you're not God. So I think it's language. So as a narratologist, I would open up the conversation around language and how we're using the language of God. Because as I have integrated through many, 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 many decades of religion, um, I started off when my mom was pregnant with me, she was a Christian scientist. So we had that experience up until I would think I was like nine or something. Then I was craving to go to a Baptist church. So there was a Baptist church um, down the street from where I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. And so I went to Baptist church and um, I sat there and I felt good because of like the music and sort of feeling into like, you know, Sunday school and, and seeing people who look like me in the church. Um, then I, I moved on to um, Pentecostal. Um, I began to be uh, born again and saved when I was 12 years old. And I went through the whole process of that. And I, at the time I was living in Mombasa, Kenya, um, came back from that and uh, went back to the Baptist church and realized, ooh, I don't fit in, um, even though these individuals look like me. Um, I have a real worldly intersectionality of myself and the word of God and how they are placing God in their sermon is not really feeling good. Um, because if we are to be a part of a collective that are supposed to be kind and nurturing to one another. I wasn't feeling that in that community, let's say. Um, so that kind of threw me off. And then um, as I got into my late teens, it was more about um, the spiritual aspect of, of, of being connected to something larger than myself. And so I've continued on this journey of understanding I am connected to something larger than myself. God is in me and around me. And because I know that I'm connected to something larger than myself, then I too am God in that connection to the, the energy that which I project out when I'm in a godly state. And the godly state is being of confidence, of being of grace, of being of, um, of a witness observing, you know, not reacting, um, but taking on a more intentional um, response to things, right? So all of that doesn't come from me, son, you, it comes from within and it comes from around that which I experience on a day to day. So therefore, yes, I do believe I am God. Now, if you take that out of the context of what we're speaking of here, um, to say I am God, just because, you know, I know that, you know, I'm, let's just say I'm guided, not even you know what? Let's not even say, you know, anything you just feel, you feel the sensations of the fact that God is me. I am God. I'm a reflection of God. Well, that may work too, especially if you are connecting to the omnipresent energy of the God in us and around us. He is, she is, they are father, mother, God. Have we not heard that before? You know, um, it's not, a human being, it's an energy system, it's a knowing, it's a feeling, it's sensation. So I think it's really 
interesting this this um discourse as we might say around god and who is god and can you be god um I wouldn't actually get hung up on it. I think it's about, are we reflecting, are we reflecting God energy? And that God energy is really what, you know, being compassionate and empathetic and understanding, graceful, you know, um, having discernment, um, you know, wanting to create healthier communities, um, God, the list goes on and on and on. And I, as I said, God, um, I've been taught, don't say God's name in vain. Well, hey, sometimes we, 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 we forget that. So, you know, religion will always play some sort of role in my life because I was a part of it for so many, you know, decades and I've experienced it. Um, but I don't believe that God is I don't believe when we speak of God, we're speaking of religion, because let me tell you this, when I am home on my soil, and like I said, I just returned from Uganda a few days ago, I felt God around me, in me, I was God, I was moving in that focused, intentional space of being witness of how nature, I mean, gosh, when you take time to just see what nature has done for us and, and how we take it for granted. And when you don't, and you just sit and listen to nature speaking to you, the trees and the birds and the water and the air, and it's, it's, it's something that I've never experience before outside of taking that moment to just be with nature. And that's God, that that's God speaking mm. for sure. So I don't have an, I don't have, it's not a binary question. It's not black or white. Yes or no. Can we be God? Are you God? I think it's really about, um, are you, are you living in the state of godliness? Oh, wow. My, um, flatmate in the room next door just started playing some music really loud uh let's see I, I might i might ask him to turn that down in a moment this is the real life of recording a podcast in your home zoo send you and i on zoom <laughs> you know send you mentioned i i think before we started recording and um you know hold on i'm gonna actually pause here okay zach patel who is currently staying with me um you know, it's funny. I'm actually living with Zach, who I he's the second guy on the TV show X Rate It. How we did the the um, dating show feedback. Who he worked with me at We Deep In, and um, and we had that little moment encounter of exploring an intimate relationship between the two of us. And now we live together. I have a three bedroom house here in Austin, and he is in one of those rooms. <laughs> Uh, which is fun. It's, it's, I, it's, he's actually family to me and it's super sweet to see how, um, you know, when you can let a relationship be and formulate and see the, the, the familiar, like we do have that, um, family bond within us. So what I wanted to get to though, is, um, you know, you mentioned before when we started recording the podcast, um, being around people who look like me. Mm. And I remember years ago in New York City, uh, you were facilitating a, a healing ritual um, with the rock star shaman, I think Allison Charles. And I had brought one of my friends with me, Timothy Bloom. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that event, you looked at me and you said, Where'd you get him? And I was like, what? What do you mean? Where'd you get him? I was like, he's my friend. I brought him. He's like, and, and Timothy is a black man. And you said, bring up more of them. <laughs> I, this again, this is probably like five, six years ago. I took that as a sort of like a real mission. <laughs> and, um, and you had said, because black men aren't coming into these spaces as often as you had wanted them to. And you wanted them more to, to, to be a part of it. And, um, uh, and I wonder if those two thoughts that you have of people who look like me, um, as in, in similar to 
um, the, the types of spaces that you're in of wanting to see more diversity within those spaces. Absolutely. So I'll start with my comment after that um, ritual. As someone who is a global citizen who has lived and traversed between two very different spaces. So I grew up in um, a very white Jewish neighborhood in Newton, Mass, right outside of Boston, and then traversed on weekends to be with my Ugandan family. And then I'm back into, you know, Newton, um, living in and out of East Africa all of my life. There is something extremely affirming when I am in environments where the, where I am the majority and there is something that I crave about being the majority. And what I have noticed about um, the spaces that I like to create and cultivate um, that I hope are uh, open, brave spaces for individuals to, um, I'll use your word, unleash, you know, to allow themselves to let go and just allow themselves to feel the sensations of the body and to be able to let that be um, the guiding light for these moments together. In that type of environment, there aren't very many uh, women or men of, of, um, of different nationalities. And at that moment, I was intrigued to see a black man in this space because not often do I see that being cultivated. Um, this was what probably seven, eight years ago. So now as time has passed, um, we're seeing um, a more diverse um, multicultural spaces um, of individuals coming together and um, participating in different ways of um, attuning to themselves, well-being practices, etc. So that has changed, which is wonderful. Um, however, there is a reason why I, I make those comments and I made the comment to you today about being home on my soil where I'm the majority, where people look like me is so affirming. It's, it's like, um, a boost of energy that I receive, <clears throat> excuse me, not only just being on my ancestral soil, but, um, my tongue. Luganda starts coming out. Um, uh, my tongue of connecting to um, ancestral uh, practices and rituals. My body is connected. Um, my my dark skin is celebrated. Um, I don't have to um, think much about how I look in the world. Right. So living in New York City and having lived in other cities of, of, of the United States, um, I'm very aware of my color. And when I was younger, it was exhausting to be so aware of my color and how I present myself and how I speak and articulate, et cetera, et cetera, whereby traveling to places where I am the majority is affirming. It gives me life. It gives me an energy. It's a key to my soul opening up to connect further to who I truly, truly am. And as I've grown older, I understand that it's not necessarily a necessity to be the majority all the time, but it is important to be able to move into spaces um, often enough because the affirming experience of being in a space of majority or individuals of different nationalities um, brings about an energy and, and power, I would say, that I don't receive when I'm in, in spaces where I'm not the majority when, you know, I'm teaching at Columbia university, there's rarely, um, other individuals who are of, uh, multicultural descent. It's, it's quite often just white, but then 
we could go into the whole talk about race and and whiteness and what is black, what is white, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, I think that's a different conversation. So therefore I've attuned to, and I've listened and, and picked up knowledge. I'm a forever seeker of knowledge to understand that we are these beautiful spiritual beings having a human experience. And what if we all could connect on levels of story and how storytelling our own stories are our stories of our ancestors, of our grandparents, of our siblings, et cetera, et cetera, can be what make us who we are and can we start to connect on that level as opposed to looking at our skin color, right? Because when we do that, that even is such an affirming place to be in. So that's what I like to do is to cultivate spaces where it's not that we are forgetting what we look like. It's more about, are we able to attune to the stories that really bridge us all together in such a beautiful, diverse way? And because I believe creating healthier communities is what I have been put on this earth to do, not just on the individual level, but a community level, I am now opening up even more to the infinite possibilities of how we can authentically connect with one another Mm -hmm. and being able to go back home to my soil is my healing. Mm -hmm. So I will always have that. Yeah, totally. Totally. And I I can see too of the, you know, in, in, in humans connecting with other humans, there is a hyper awareness around race right now. So it makes sense that I re I remember when, you know, race became a, you know, it's, it's, it's all these experiences, but one of the confusing things for me, um, during, you know, after what, 2020, uh, during 2020, uh, I started to notice more of people's skin colors when I was talking to them interesting because we were hyper aware the conversation was it was we were hyper aware and and I actually went through an uncomfortable period of time where I didn't like that all of a sudden now I was because before I was in conversation and story and 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 just connecting I mean I I've had awareness my my father as you know um his my bonus mother is a black woman and um, they've been they were together for 15 years and they separated uh, a few years ago and she's we still have a close relationship. She's my bonus mom and she's black. Uh, and it was always kind of fun. I'd go out in the world and, you know, I'd be with my they were they had a 17 year old age difference. So it was fun to go to comedy clubs and she has a big personality. And, you know, so the external world would look look at them being like, what's going on here? You've got this like young black woman, this old white guy and and they have this quirky relationship and they're bantering back and forth and having a really good time. Um, and so it was just part of um, my existence. And then when the conversation became hyper, like when it when we be came um, hyper-focused on race, there became this deeper awareness that I felt, oh, this is now my Black friend, and this is now this, and it was... Mm. Um, and so I imagine, too, as you're saying, that awareness then brings the awareness onto you. It's like we're all hyper-aware, so I'm hyper-aware of my difference because I can tell you're aware of it, too. So these underlying currents that we pick up, and and I'll, I'll give this to you know, to compare it to something um, different, you know, on, on, there's a podcast episode with, uh, um, I believe Danielle, not Danielle Diamond, Maya Diamond, a relationship coach. Um, she, she's an attachment coach. And um, the, the episode is um, something titled vulnerability. It's probably like 20 episodes ago. And her and I were processing through a previous relationship, the one I had with, um, you know, the virtual reality guy. Yes. And, um, and I was sharing how there was something that he was, he was withholding a piece of information from me, um, because he had a painful experience, but I was somewhat aware of the situation through my own Google searching and trying to, to 
figure it out on my own, but he wasn't telling me about it. I wasn't asking about it. And so there's this underlying current that, that created something that both of us weren't necessarily like we were feeling, but not necessarily speaking to. So I think in these underlying currents that are, um, um, that when people become hyper aware of things, there's a, I don't want to say it's a dis disconnection. So if I was in a room full of a bunch of blonde haired, blue eyed people, I wouldn't necessarily feel like I've arrived at home, <laughs> but where I do feel is when I'm with somebody who there's like a gentleman right now that I'm working with and his brain is structured very similar to mine. And it's really obvious. Like when I speak about things business wise, he picks them up and he knows what I'm talking about. And it's been a rare, rare experience for me um, to meet somebody who has a brain structured. And I can, I know this from the work that I do with Aboutly um, has taught me how the different brains are assessing information. And I can tell very easily that, wow, this man's brain is structured like my brain and I'm speaking the same language. So, so you speak upon, sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to just touch upon that, the last sentence, you speak the same language. So there's yes. something that I had said to you around my tongue opens up when I'm home in East yes. Africa, in Uganda. Yes. It's then what we're talking about is that cultural way that we connect to ourselves, how culture connects to us, right? So even in this dialogue with your, with your um, client, you or the person you're working with, there is a cultural cultural connection around understanding how the brain works. And that in itself is what brings you to, that is one of the, the points in which you two come together. So you're absolutely right because me being in a room full of people who look like me, I might not actually connect with them, but it's on a cultural aspect. So therefore I become more attuned to what type of spaces I'm allowing myself to occupy because you're absolutely right. Again, just because someone looks like you does not mean that you've had the same lived experiences, the same, you know, um, you know, you're on the same economic level that you have, you know, it, basically the same lived experiences is really, truly a connection point with others. Now, what's beautiful about being in the world and being a global citizen is that Hey, you actually might not have the same lived experience as I, but I'm still interested in connecting, right? So it's so nuanced. And I think to just bring it back to 2020 around George Floyd and, you know, all of the, up, the, you know, racial uprising and, you know, what we were experiencing and witnessing as what I would call like race relations in the United States, um, is the fact that we actually have not dug into why the United States has such a problem in, the, in, in, in connecting the dots with people who are of black descent. And I, Again, this is for a different podcast, but I just want to bring that out to say we have a problem here in the United States of America around being vulnerable, authentic, and speaking the truth about historical events. So because we don't do that, we witness and we continue to witness what we're witnessing around race relations and sort of the the disconnect that we might be feeling in the world, okay, around fill in the blank, you know, like around anything and everything. So for me, it's, again, I go back to the affirmation of being in, in, in a place where people look like me. That's really what I'm talking about when I go back home to East Africa, you know, um, that's my place of, of, of healing that that's my therapist. The mm -hmm. continent is my therapist. So, um, when I go home, I'm in deep therapy, I'm rooted in that. And that feels so good. And it charges me up to then return back to the West with a, with a new charged soul, a new charged spirit. Um, it, it, it brings in the infinite possibilities of how I can and have always had the opportunity to traverse the world. And due to 
how much we move so much in the United States and the West and how much the hustle mentality and, and how we're supposed to, you know, just everything's, it's like we're taught that things are hard to achieve. I can come back from the continent back to the West and remind myself you can achieve and will achieve just as much as you desire, even when you slow it down. You know, we move through stuff so quickly. We, we talk about, I've been working 36 hours today. And, and, and we look at that as like, oh my God, this person is achieving everything that they want to achieve. But are you really like achieving stuff by just like moving? So, you know, staying so diligent in a space that, um, might actually require you to step away from. You just said yesterday, you took 50 minutes out to, 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 to view and listen to a video that was inspiring. We're not talking about that a lot here in the West. It's all about like work, work, work. How much time are you putting in? Um, you know, how are you executing and are you, you know, gleaning out what you want to out of it? Hey, yeah. I used to be a part of the hustle mentality quite a bit. And yeah, I, I achieved quite a bit. Um, but my body was like, Hey girl, <laughs> what's up? Acne was starting to come up. Um, I'm already, you know, a former athlete from high school and parts of college, and I was losing weight. Um, I was having gut health issues. And that is where I understood I needed to change my life. When I started to get those gut health issues, when I woke up paralyzed one day, this was 12 years ago, I think you might remember this, and I couldn't move my right side of my body mm -hmm. for several months. Um, that's when I knew I needed to find a different way of being. Um, and that slowing down was a part of a part of it. And also being um, gifted the opportunity to work with an amazing prophet healer um, whom my partner introduced me to, who sadly has passed on, however, has taught me so much about love, about our magic that lives within us about God, about how, what you put your mind to and ask for, and you stay diligent in that it will come. Often we ask God, Awei, Buddha, the universe for something. And then the next thought is shit, how am I going to get that? I'm not, that's not possible. I got to pay rent next week. Damn. I have this bill coming in. There's no possible way that I'm going to be able to achieve the thing that you just asked for. So it's that space in between what you ask for and your thoughts that I work within with people mm -hmm. is, is, is coming to that space of steadfastness and clarity. And let's be clear. I work through that every day myself right? Um, even within the shamanic practices of the bone healer of my indigenous lineage, I am still in this human body and I still make mistakes. And I still have to bring myself back to myself, to the present moment and remind myself, I am not my thoughts. And so that place that I work within, I believe I've become uh, very attuned to it because I'm, I'm paying attention to it for myself. And I think a lot of us who are educators, as I call myself, I call you an educator, Christina, is because we have lived a lot of what we're teaching, if not everything that we're teaching. The internet connectedness of um, all these existing circumstances or the space between that we're in right now as a society, I Think of, you know, when you shared the experience of um, being in America and race and, you know, the, our, our challenge with vulnerability and authenticity um, and acknowledgement, um, I see the, you know, the interconnectedness and the correlation between one of my desires is to see infidelity and cheating, like those terms being eradicated that people are so truthful of where they are. And so it, it supports us and we can all 
more even understand our own reality that we're living in. Because when you are cheating and lying or not acknowledging who you are and being authentic in your existence, you're robbing somebody else from their own reality. Um, and they're living in some type of disillusion and, and they don't have the free will to live their own experience. And um, you mentioned this word discernment um, and discernment has been coming up a lot around me because, you know, as, as we tune more in, you know, we, we had said that a good title for this podcast before we push it could, could be in, you know, listening to the body and when you consider discernment in our experiences and how the body is related to it, how would you, how do you navigate the experience of connecting with other individuals while tuning in your body to be discerning about where you're spending your time and energy? It's quite beautiful how quickly it happens. Um, I, before I walk into rooms, into spaces, um, I've already set an intention of how I would like to show up, how I want to. And now um, we're talking about spaces. I, I think that I, you know, I'm choosing to walk into, right? Um, a party. Are you saying a party? Let's say, let's say a party. Yeah, let's use that as a party event, which nine times out of 10, I won't be there anyway because <laughs> parties aren't my thing, but nonetheless, an event. And um, I've already decided before I've walked into the room that I am going to meet individuals that are in alignment with me, that I... Um, I send love to the room before I walk in the room. Um, I protect myself energetically. Um, I take a moment to just, uh, to just be in the body before I walk into the room. It's like this whole thing that happens very quickly. Like this happens all within, you know, moments. Um, and if I feel in the body that I'm not aligning with individuals in the space, then I, I, you know, I exit. Um, I, I, I can softly just disconnect out of the space physically and uh, mentally, emotionally. Um, it's a practice I've had to learn because before when I was younger, um, you know, I'm very outgoing, vivacious. Um, people think I'm totally an extrovert, but I really am an introvert because I can actually hold space with laughter and good conversation and um, not necessarily have to reveal too much of myself. That was when I was younger. As I'm older, I want to reveal who I am. And I want to be in spaces um, that affirm that. And if they're not affirming um, my ability to be vulnerable, then I have to make some decisions there. Um, when I'm at work, you know, I, I do uh, I, I teach lectures and seminars outside of Columbia. I'm not always going to be in spaces that make me feel good. Um, and that's okay too, because there's a learning there. Um, and therefore it becomes quite the practice of, um, being present in my body and, um, listening more. If I'm in spaces that I might not feel comfortable, I'm listening even more than, than I have before, because I want to learn what is it that's making me uncomfortable. And sometimes you might find that it's your own self that's making you uncomfortable. You've created a barrier of entry for people to connect with you. Um, so there's, there's a nuance to it. And that nuance though, is always around listening to the sensations of my body, because that is my biggest teacher. Um, and it's a practice. It's something that we all, I believe, uh, practice daily. Um, I mean, you know, when you're living in New York city and you walk into a subway car and if you, sometimes you just feel something, you're like, nope, <laughs> walk right out. <laughs> You don't even have to necessarily see anything. You might feel something, you know? So that's what I, I, I bring it back to the beginning of the importance of metaphysics and understanding that energy moves and we're a part of a whole energy system. So if there is an energy system that is of of, of, of friction or, or discomfort to you um, and you don't allow yourself 
to feel the sensations of what that feels like, to acknowledge it before you disconnect, you're going to keep going into those same damn energy systems. So even when you walk into that subway car and you're like, nope, not the car for me, I hope that we are acknowledging why. So there's a reflection piece that might happen. So you might go back in your brain and be like, oh, it smelled funky or, you know, uh, it just didn't feel safe. You know, it doesn't matter. Even that small moment of acknowledgement of why the sensation of discomfort was coming through you is also the key to, to, to let it go. So I'd love to tie all this into infidelity and cheating uh, because I, I see that this withholding of oneself for fear of really like, like sharing that you have these desires or these other uh, means to connect. And maybe it's even coming from an addiction. Maybe it's come from an unhealthy, maybe it's, it's healthy that you want to connect with other people. Maybe it's an unhealthy thing that you want to connect with other people, but you're not presenting that truth to somebody. And I want to more focus on the person who is feel, having the betrayal experience. Uh, because a lot of times I think that that person knows or you know, I've, I've heard the stories of the shock of, of I've been with them for 18 years and for the past 15 years of our relationship, he's been lying and cheating. And, um, and now I've just discovered this and I've, my life feels like I've just lived, a you know, a disillusioned reality. Um, however, you know, we talk about the body and the body knows. And in that, you know, when sure the external stimuli can create suffering for us, you know, I need to pay my bills and I'm short money. And there's these things that can create, um, um, you know, challenge for us of being human, uh, and also suffering really hits us in our attachments, our attachments to the other human beings. And sometimes we don't want to believe it. I, I work with couples all the time who, and, and hear stories for them as well, that they don't want to go to the transformation workshop. They don't want to do therapy. They don't want to do a plant medicines because if they do that, that that's going to, they're going to have to change. You just said it. You just said it. Change. Ain't nobody really interested in changing, honestly, when it comes down to, I mean, it is not an easy road to um, tap into the discomfort of not doing the same thing over and over again, um, because we're used to it, right? So I think what you are saying is exactly what we fear is change. So whether or not you feel it in the body that you have been, um, you know, cheated on or not, it doesn't matter. There's, there's that that fear that things will change if you acknowledge what you are experiencing. And it's natural. It's normal for all of us to fear change. I mean, I think about children, um, you know, part of their growth, right, is to understand the discomfort of, of the no and of things change. And when children get comfortable with the changes of life, they're better equipped with tools to be able to um, um, move through the change with grace or move through change with more of a curiosity as opposed to this is bad and it's going to be bad for me. So as we get to become adults in this world and we are forced to look at life. Ooh, this is like coming through like bodily, you know, for me around change is, are you able to tap into the bravery and courage that we all have been born with? And is it possible to, um, the language that I use is step over the threshold. You know, oftentimes we feel like we're stepping, you know, like when you open the door, there's the threshold between where you're standing and 
you know, where you're going. Um, can you step over that threshold and move into a different way of being a different mm -hmm. way of responding and not reacting per se. So I don't know a lot about infidelity and, and cheating, um, anymore because I have made a decision to be really aware of my bodily sensations around, um, inconsistency and, um, um, understanding more about my value systems. Um, I was in a very bad relationship in my twenties and I experienced infidelity and cheating. And I mean, you just put it on the table. I probably experienced that in my twenties, um, with this one particular, um, relationship. And, um, it took me probably 10 years later to really look at what was it that I was denying of myself because there's always signs to, you know, when I say signs, experiences of, of, of things, just not again, going back to the body feeling right. So, um, I have a list of things that I was ignoring because I didn't and, or was scared, fearful of change. So as I've gotten older, I am grateful for the experiences that I've had um, in my dating life and the experiences that I've witnessed of others in their, you know, dating life and, and marriage or lifelong partnerships um, and feel very uh, grateful to have cultivated um, a partner that, um, that is in alignment with values that we both hold, um, and some that which we may not, but we can communicate and, um, and connect on that level too, because you're not always going to agree with your partner. Right. Um, and then also trust, you know, trusting, trusting oftentimes we're, we're not taught how to trust, you know, where it's like we're thrown into the fire of life to just you know, trust, you know, our parents and, 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 and trust, you know, our good friends and such, but, um, but, but how are we being taught how to trust? It's, it's an external teaching, right? It's like, well, that's the person that you should trust. And over there, you should trust that. And, you know, if I give you this, you know, you should trust that this is a good thing for you. Um, we're not taught that trust starts from, from within, from the heart, right? Like if we, if we can trust that what we are feeling in the body, the sensations in the body is really the truth, then I believe that we're on a, a, a more expansive road in learning how to not just only trust other people, but ourselves. And that's the self-love piece and the way in which I think we developed, we develop um, positive self-love, well-being tools to help us um, navigate this, this world. Mm. Yeah. Changes, changes a practice for Absolutely. sure. Um, and also the more you change, the more that it change becomes easier to mm -hmm. do and changes can even come from, you know, when we say moving the body is when you go to a workout class throughout the entire class, you're always being asked to change, <laughs> like yeah, change yeah. this position, yeah. do it this way, do it that way. You know, different instructors are always having you change your body in all different ways throughout it. And there's times where I'm in the middle of the workout class. I'm like, when is this over? <laughs> I'm done. I want to stop changing. Yes, <laughs> yes. You keep making me change to do these other things. And that's even, you know, um, I've never had the problem necessarily of driving to the same office for, you know, a significant period of time. My dad, on the other hand, you know, he worked for the same company for 49 years. Mm. And to driving that distance to and from work, the same path every day. I mean, you have to find ways that you can do it differently. Mm. Um, and so your the neural pathways in your brain are, you know, the, the, it can shift, you know, there yes. can be a release, there can be yeah. 
um, the the plasticity of it um, yes. evaporates. And so when we don't necessarily practice um, change, um, and and it can be again in the really small ways of. Um, tonight I'm going to, I've always slept on my side. I'm going to change and I'll sleep on my back. Um, I'm going to change the style of the clothes that I wear. Yes. yes. Just these small things to um, create change. Now on the other perspective, um, there's some of us that um, and can practice staying because maybe there is, maybe change could be an avoidant behavior that is adapted. Um, we, you know, in, in relations, uh, we, we spoke about, you know, before we push record to the podcast of, of, um, reconciling, um, you know, when, when we bring God into the equation and trust, um, I actually, you know, human beings trusting human beings, it's, we're also all ever changing. So what are you trusting in, in a whole humans are humans, you know, we're spiritual people having a human experience and that human experience um, limits us in some capacity. Uh, you know, it's like, do you trust the words that come of, out of their mouth because they're not their words? Uh, what are you trusting about? You can trust God. I think of like, I can trust a higher power and, um, and God to guide my journey into the connection with this person and to disconnection with this person. Um, but when there's desire there of, um, you know, being in our younger years, um, I always, you know, Alona Roy Smitkin was a, a, a dear friend of mine who passed away at 101 last year. And she, speaks about how she didn't as she reached enlightenment you know or, or, or you know and and that's even an interesting word enlightenment but she reached enlightenment in her after her 80s she said and it was when she uh, stopped caring what people thought about her and stopped ha- having this need to be accepted and this need to shine mm. um, and it's an interesting perspective because stop having the need to shine, you know, in dating, I will often share with people shine so brightly so they can see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's this duality aspect to it because Mm -hmm. we have these life desires for me. One, you know, I haven't, I'm 42 and I haven't yet released the desire to create family or children. And I've been connecting with somebody who um, has had that life experience already. And I want to project all my desires onto him uh, because we're connecting and it's a wonderful, uh, you know, deep, intimate experience. And so it's confusing for my brain sometimes because I'm like, well, I should walk away from this. Like, why am I here? Why am I, this person isn't going to give me what I want. Um, But then now I have these, um, innate desires and this need, or it's not even necessarily need, it's a desire. And so there's a confusing aspect that can come within that. And as I'm speaking and I can drop further into bo- my body and remember that my body will know yes. when it's time to disconnect. Yes. Yes. And I think that's what you um, landed on in our sort of pre-conversation is that the body will know. And there's another sort of, you know, sort of spiritual saying that I like to say is, you know, all in divine timing, you know, um, let go, (laughs) you know, let God, um, I like to say, I place it on the altar and I, I, you know, I continue on my journey. So when there's like those big questions that I don't have answers for, and my body is doing something different than what my brain is saying I should be doing, I release, I release expectation. I release the, 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 the need to know the future, you know, um, Yes, we are placed to make hard decisions sometimes. Um, and we delay making hard decisions often, right? Because we were talking about change and, you know, uh, change is, 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 is partially difficult when you're not used to changing. Um, however, in particular to your 
um, sharing of the individual you're dating, my sort of understanding of spirits connecting, um, of creating deep relationships with one another, even when they're not completely aligned with their wantings and, and their desires in life. Um, as we often do think of a future with the person that we're dating, um, what if we were to just let all of that stuff go and just be mm-hmm. and be allow things to unfold the way they are, What's even the way it? they're supposed to be. It's even to that word dating. Uh, he uses that word dating and I don't even necessarily resonate that, ex- that, ex- that term even limits our experience because dating is your, when you're dating somebody, there's, um, and, and granted, this is language. So maybe I was just going to say, you're, you're educating me now. This is not reframing with house. dating. <laughs> How dating is used generally in our, our culture is that it's a process of, um, it's a, it's like a, it's a, it's a process to get to commitment. Oh, You're, I see. Like, and, and people date for all, I guess people date for all different reasons, but the, the term itself was initially created, um, for that pre space between engagement and then marriage. And one can say, I don't. I don't think that even after you're married, though, you should stop dating. You should continue dating your partner. So um, can dating I, also mean get to know? Is that what you're saying? So dating is to is the process of getting to know someone before in the Western culture, commitment, i.e. marriage is placed. Maybe I'm even reframing dating in my mind. It, it, it is because. One could say friends date each other, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Because we're mm-hmm. having these experiences to um, that we continue to choose to opt in for and we mm-hmm. enjoy and we're like, oh, we keep enjoying. Let's do this again. Let's do this again. Um, and then this outcome oriented aspect of it that, okay, what's where's this, what are we aiming to achieve here? Where it's, what's the outcome of this? And mm-hmm. um, that's putting a whole other level of pressure into that experience. Um, yeah. Language is, is important and it's limiting sometimes. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's where we started. What, is it that you are feeling in the body when you're speaking of dating or, you know, these words that we are um, taught to use, you know, um, I've often thought about what it would look like to be in a room where you can't talk or write All it is, is about the connection through touch, through sight, through listening. Um, There is something in there that is offering us a place of curiosity and playfulness to understand what these different sensations feel like. Um, and I know you do a lot of bringing people together in feeling and touching and, um, exploring, you know, bodies. Um, I come from a spiritual angle of what that looks like in a place where all you're allowed to do is listen. I've often wanted, I've, I've wanted to do this on a date. It's like have silent, silent dates. And I just wrote down, I, I want to do a silent dating experience. Like um, imagine monthly in your town that, um, there was a yeah a silent dating experience. No numbers can be exchanged. No words are exchanged. And just all the people come together 
um, clothes on, you know, I know we're talking yes. about play parties here and there, but yes. clothes on at this clothes silent yes. dating experience, you come, you go and you just see mm-hmm. you're witnessing mm-hmm. yourself in mm-hmm. the energetics of them. Mm-hmm. And you're um, witnessing the people who mm-hmm. are in your space. Yes. And then you go out in the world. And yes. maybe you run into them at the grocery store yes. or at another experience. Maybe you don't, um, but there's no need to grasp onto those connections. That's why I'm not even worried about the exchanging of numbers because they live in your hometown. Right. And if you're meant to see each other again, it'll be divinely arranged. Yes, it will. Yes. Oh it my will. God. I want to do silent dating. Experiences. Yes. That's I, I would be curious to, to, to participate. Um, as a witness, you know, to that, um, because you said it, you know, you're witnessing and observing and within narrative practice, the power of being witnessed is so deeply informed in what we see of ourselves. So many times individuals are not being witnessed, you know, um, they're living life quite singly, you know, um, uh, maybe interacting with people, maybe, you know, and when you're disconnected from being witnessed, um, that also too can cause dis-ease, you know, how often is it that um, we're told you're doing a good job or I appreciate you. Um, those are just small ways to witness someone, but to be in a space, to be witness of who you are energetically. Ooh. Yeah. And what if we, you know, Welcome to bring your journal, bring a book, sure. um, leave your phone behind. Yes, um, definitely. Bring anything in, <laughs> into the space. You're welcome to sit and meditate. It. You can watch. Uh, you know, if we do it at the Alpaca Playhouse here in, in Austin, you can walk around with alpacas. I think give them this nature, yes. um, like a, a nature environment to be in. Um, contemplate life again. Yeah, I think the journaling and the this is your time to just um, be, just be observe also to be witnessed. I mean, maybe there's some sweet music playing at the, Mm -hmm. at the same time. And, um, that invites movement. If you'd like to move, yes. Um, sure. Bring your yoga mat. If you like to stretch, um, maybe, maybe there are some different stations that you can, uh, join in. I, 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 I'm hesitant to add in um, anything that confines somebody to where they're following something else. Yes. Um, well, the elements you're 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 bringing in um, and curiously cultivating a space that we want individuals to uh, be observing or observant of, and also to be witnessed in. And I can't think of anything better than, you know, nature. And so you, you talked about this space with alpacas and maybe there's an element of water there that one can, you know, participate in, whether it's, you know, mindful drinking of the water or playing with the water or, you know, um, soil. I don't know. It's just you, you, you hit something. You definitely have, uh, hit something. And, um, and my curiosity of what that space would look like. Um, I'm, I'm definitely thinking, how can I, um, facilitate something like that, uh, within the spaces that I, you know, cultivate and also thinking, um, about the retreats that I do back in Mama Africa. Um, you know, the element elements, um, are really important to tap into as that's where our indigenous, um, energy stems from, you know, the Mm. elements of nature. Um, yeah. What do you have coming up? Where does somebody get access to your work? Um, my website, sunnybaragua.com. This is a new Um, website, right? It's my new website. I launched it, um, actually, right. I launched it 
um, spring solstice. Um, and it was really a labor of love for almost a year. Um, talk about fear, you know, of, you know, releasing things that are new and such. Um, it was such a beautiful journey. So yes, sunyubergwa.com. Um, also I'm on Instagram at, uh, Sunny Bone Healer. Um, I do uh, retreats. I have a new training program, uh, Narrative Medicine and Spirituality, in the fall of 2023, so September. So we're we're bringing in registration now. I do one-on-one work, which I truly love as well. And um, I curate. I, I take one-on-one students um, every couple of, of uh, months and... Um, I actually currently have some openings. So if anyone was interested in working with me one-on-one, but sunyubergwood.com is where you can find me. Amazing. Thank you, Sunyu. Thank you for the friendship. Thank you. And, uh, by the way, I, because Sunyu has been a part of Feminine Weapon Day since 2014, uh, I have, I, today I pay the deposit for the venue for January 30th and it's July. Oh my <laughs> God. So Congratulations. Yeah. So this I will be, we're doing, I'm it. doing it. Austin, Texas. Okay. January 30th, the, the 10th annual Feminine Weapon Day. Yes. It'll be on the 11th year, but I'm going to go run with it. So 10th annual. Yes. And um, I, I guess that wouldn't be the 10th annual anymore because one year was skipped. What do you do? Do you say it's the 11th annual? No, it's it's the 10th one. Do I have to get rid of the annual? I don't know. I have to figure that Your out. Your brain, you're thinking too much now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yes, that, that'll happen, um, January 30th here in Austin, Texas. And Sun Yu has been a part of Feminine Weapon Day since year one. Together, we've raised over 75,000 for children of abuse, extreme poverty, and human trafficking, um, for them to receive education, art, and healing programs. And, uh, yeah, there are 150 million orphans worldwide, 80, 18 million children living without a single parent. And, I believe that if we can bring love, give love, be the parents of the universe to these children and they can feel because there's a feeling experience of love inside of their body that people care about them, then we will shift the vibration of the universe into a more loving, godly experience. Absolutely. Amina, you've just set your intention. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank, thank you, love. you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of Deep In with Christina. Again, if you enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, follow, rate, give it five stars, helps more people find it, helps me continue to host it. And definitely check out that calendar at wedeepin.com. Come be with us in real life. And I highly recommend if you are wanting to shift some energies with inside of you to um, reach out to send you and invite her into a one-on-one session or explore her work um, on our website. I will link that in the description. Thanks everybody. Bye for now. Love you.